thanks to everyone here for uh, joining us again. Um, you know, if you didn't hear a bit of the conversation before and you have not been able to take part in last week's um, session on TV, you should go click that link that David Fox put into the, um, to the chat box there. And even if you did go, go, you know, do it, go and look at it again and, and uh, listen to yourselves, ask great questions and, uh, and hear the responses. I think it's, it's worth a review at either way. Um, before we get started, I uh, just want to welcome our mentor uh, professionals who have joined us this evening um, in no particular order, just as I see them. We have Herrick Goldman uh, there. We have, hello, we have Don Holder and we have Roy Abab. And um, I'm going to allow all of these folks to introduce themselves this evening um, before we get going. But I guess I should say something like good evening and welcome to this debate on you know lighting design for theater and dance uh, my name is josh allen i will be tonight's moderator for this debate and the topic of the debate is as follows um, we will discuss theater lighting design as well as dance lighting design and the theory of special creations of projects in these specific genres um, not really. So we're not doing any of that. Uh, we're going to keep this very. We're going to keep this very organic. We are going to talk about those topics, but I do want to um, uh, kind of keep things flowing and hope that you all will ask questions as we go along. This should be a, an evening uh, where you're able to do those things. Um, I'm sure some of you are dying to ask very specific questions to to these wonderful folks who have joined us, and and I hope you will get a lot uh, out of this and be able to take a lot away from it. Um, so without further ado, let's start with, uh, our mentors for the evening and, uh, just have them introduce yourselves. Um, I think many of us know, know who you are and know some, let's, let's start with, uh, I, the order keeps changing. So I don't know if David's playing like musical Brady Bunch here with, um, <laughs> <laughs> with, these, with these images. We'll start with Don Holder. You're at the very top of my screen, Don. Um, tell us a bit about yourself and how, uh, and maybe just kind of how you got started and, and what got you into our crazy industry and, and, and how you ended up here and, uh, take it away. Um, well, hi, good to see everybody. Uh, I, I think I've, I, I've often, I've been asked this question a couple of times before, and I feel like for me being, becoming a lighting designer was sort of inevitable. I, my parents took me to the theater when I was really young to Broadway shows. Um, I started getting interested in lighting when I was maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I've been kind of working in some form with light ever since then. I was the, in Boy Scouts, I was always the kid who was lighting the campfires and setting smoke smudge pots along the ceremonial trails etc i always seem to be you know the, the lighting guy from uh, you know a very early age so it was kind of a natural progression for me of course it was a bit of a circuitous path my parents didn't want me to study theater so i um the the compromise was i i went to the university of maine and studied forestry which was my other Real interest. So I have actually have a bachelor of science degree in forestry. I, I, I got a graduate degree, uh, an MFA from Yale eventually. But um, so I, I was like most people, probably very much like you just a few years ago or even now. I had a lot of interest. I was really into music. I played several instruments. Um, and in college, I kind of did everything. It was kind of a self-designed liberal arts degree. And ultimately, uh, after a few uh, stops and starts, I, I kind of set off on the path that I really wanted to follow, which was lighting. I, I worked um, after the University of Maine doing various things, including a little stint with Van Halen and a, and a few other crazy opportunities. I worked at a, a small college in Pennsylvania and then went to grad school and uh, sort of never looked back after that. I assisted my mentor, Jennifer Tipton, for a year and um, really been uh, you know, I didn't really think much about my career trajectory, just that I wanted to do this. And um, I just started working and really never looked back. I had a lot of, um, I think my my sort of career path is really a 
um, classic example of being in the right place at the right time. I can sort of trace some of the things, the big be beats of my career trajectory um, to specific events um, that were not organized by me or not um, really anticipated. They just kind of happened. And I think that's one of the great things about this business that we're in. Uh, you know, any day your life can change for the better, I guess for the worse, but, um, you know, you want to be optimistic about it. So I've, I've been doing this uh, uh, for uh, quite some time. I, I feel very fortunate. I've done, I, I don't want to repeat my resume, but I, I've done quite a few shows on Broadway, <laughs> regional theater. I, I've worked in uh, architectural design. I'm, I'm doing some television lighting now. I have in the past. Um, and uh, really, it's been, uh, I've been very lucky. Some of the shows you may know that I've worked on, are, I guess the biggest one is The Lion King which actually was my first Broadway musical, believe it or not. Um, I thought uh, there was a certain point in my life where I thought I would never design a Broadway musical, and then my first one was The Lion King. So I guess that was kind of good. Um, and uh, I teach at uh, Rutgers University. I taught at CalArts. Teaching is a very important part of my life because it was, I, I think I'm the product of uh, great mentoring, and that's why I'm I'm here this evening also. I mean, I believe in it, um, and, and I think it's, it's great to see such am amazing practitioners joining um, the conversation tonight. So I think that's all I'll, I'll say for now. That's great. I think there'll be lots of opportunity to expand on that, and I'm sure everybody wants to hear and, and ask some uh, very specific questions probably to, to have you answer. Uh, great. Let's, uh, let's go on to Roya. She's muted. I'm, oh, there you go. I think I'm on mute. Yes? You can hear me? Yes. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, my, the way I got into this, I think, started the way a lot of uh, lighting folks did. I acted as a child and um, made the decision at some point that I'd, I'd much rather tell a story through light than on stage. Um, and... Um, I went and I got my undergrad at North Carolina School of the Arts, um, and that's where I met Al Crawford. And uh, upon graduating, I started working with the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, um, and so I've been touring with them for about ten years. Um, and um, I've also spent a lot of time doing um, uh, working with Arc Three Design, which is Al Crawford's um, uh, event design company, and. We've done um, anything ranging from architectural installations um, to concerts to galas to uh, branding events, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, I think that um, what I enjoy most about the the balance of the two is being able to bring a background in dance and theatrical lighting to some more unconventional type of events like um like the the private events and things like that so that's kind of what i do that that's great and, and uh that's actually a perfect segue i think into into herrick here um <laughs> because, you know we've had a number of conversations about you know how we use our skill sets from what we do in the theater or dance uh lighting and uh, sort of segueing those into other opportunities. Um, and I know Herrick's done some of that, especially recently. The, uh, you, you've got a great, great project that just finished up, but uh, we'll let Herrick talk more about that. Herrick, introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Herrick Golden. Uh, much like Roya and, and Don, I'm just learning. Uh, I was a terrible actor in high school, uh, and I learned that at the Summerstock Theater. And uh, fortunately, I was at a Summerstock Theater in Western Massachusetts that, uh, that let you do and made you do everything as an apprentice. And I ended up with a wrench in my hand uh, working overnight in a tent uh, because that's when you cue things in a tent and uh, watching uh, a very talented lighting designer named Mary Tarantino design theater in the round and, and uh, plays literally in the middle of the night and we became absolutely fascinated. And fortunately for me, some of the actors in that company uh, were returning that fall to SUNY Purchase, and they invited me to come visit the campus. And I went there and fell in love with uh, with uh, the campus and the, the the study plan, the fact that everybody was always doing shows and 
in, you were in tech or you were in class learning about design and then you were off to the, stu the, the, the scene shop or the stage or something like that and you never got any time to sleep. Uh, and yeah, I absolutely fell in love with that. And uh, so I ended up going so. to sleep. I just, you, you there, good. Uh, and um, after that, I, and I got a job in the summers uh, in Boston because I'm a Massachusetts boy uh, running follow spot for nonsense. Uh, and I can't tell you how many productions of how many performances of that I did. Uh, it's in the hundreds. And that gave me daytime speed to go sling a rent at the American Repertory Theater with a guy named John Ambrosoni, who's another brilliant lighting designer. <clears throat> and uh, one thing led to another. And uh, I got a call from uh, actually, sorry, I was doing um, what at the time we called like corporate theater or industrials with a company called Capron. <clears throat> And I kept telling the, the woman who was doing the hiring very naively, I said, but I'm a lighting designer. If you need someone to design these park hands that are going up in a park, you know, call me. And that actually worked because she called one day and she said, you know, MIT is looking for a lighting designer. And I said, great, what show are they doing? And she said, no, they're looking for someone to do their entire year and, and teach lighting design. And I said, great. And I went and I uh, met the, uh, the head of design and uh, they ended up hiring me mostly as the lighting designer for about a dozen shows a year, a dozen to 20 shows a year. And eventually I ended up teaching students there because the, the students there are incredible. And after about the second load in, they said, how do you choose color? How do you know what light to put there? And, and I said, well, we're going to have to do a seminar. And I asked permission to do a seminar as somebody who only has a BFA and uh, knowing that <coughs> MIT, you can't teach without a PhD. And, uh, and they said, oh, no, you're, you're going to teach a class every Wednesday at 9 a.m. And I was like, oh, sure I am. And that went on for two years. And I taught lighting, uh, lighting one and lighting two. And we actually graduated somebody with a master's degree, a partial master's degree in lighting design that I was their thesis advisor for. Uh, fortunately, he became an engineer because it's MIT. Um, and uh, yeah, so I did a lot of work around Boston, met a lot of people, really honed my craft and got to build a portfolio of my own. And then uh, when my wife went to NYU Law, I ended up down in New York, where I was born in Brooklyn, so that was an easy transition. And I ended up doing television lighting design um, for some folks who are still, still working to this day with the caveat that uh, while I was their slave in the office, I would be able to say yes to all the off-off-Broadway shows that I wanted to do, or all of them, uh, that were going to pay me $100 for 10 days worth of work. And, uh, and they allowed, that allowed me to do that. I, I, I'd be, I was being paid something like $20,000 a year to go draft in Minicad 5. And, uh, and then, but I, you know, I, I got to go downtown in the East Village and design dozens of little shows and build relationships. And uh, now I sort of design a lot of things. I do a bunch of off-Broadway shows. I do regional shows. Uh, I did the Pittsburgh Ballet a couple of years ago. We were supposed to be remounting that, uh, that production of Alice in Wonderland this season, but not so much. Um, and I, I, I find that it goes in waves. I find that I end up doing a lot of theater and then I say, wow, I really want to do something big, some giant corporate thing with a thousand lights in a, in a football stadium. And, and then I sort of focus on that for a little bit. I just, I just make the right phone calls or run into the right people. And, and lo and behold, I'm doing five or six of those in a row. And it's like, oh, man, I really need to be in a theater somewhere. So I, it just, it's not intentional. And I, I can kind of tell you how it happens, but it's, it's an ebb and a flow. And it's, it's making friends and relationships and keeping them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Roya and I have worked together, and every time I see her, it brings a smile to my face. And uh, you know, oh, it's, just, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's just that's that's how that's going. Uh, the big thing that Josh mentioned is where uh, uh, LaGuardia Airport's brand new Terminal B has a water feature in the middle of it with three laser projectors around it, uh, projectors that use lasers as a source. And uh, we have created bespoke content. Uh, there's 11 different short mm -hmm. videos that go throughout the day. Uh, and if you happen to be flying Southwest or American out of LaGuardia anytime soon, uh, you'll see it. But hopefully mm -hmm. it, it will run for many years. So you'll see it eventually. Well, that's great. Thanks, there's thanks, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you said something interesting to me and you know, having having these students here who have just either gone through undergrad or in grad school, um, obviously, 
uh, you guys have gotten training and you've, you've, uh, worked with folks in your educational environments and you, you've learned the book smarts and you've done those kind of things. Um, how important do you guys, uh, Don and Roy and Herrick, uh, or, or maybe not how important, but how do you see well, something Herrick said, uh, he, he slung a wrench for a while, you know, how important is it to understand the, you know, what goes into uh, putting something together when it's your design, understanding what the technicians and folks have to go through. Do you, is there experience there that you feel everybody should gain before that? Or is it something that, you know, you reach a point and you got to put down the wrench. Can you guys just speak to speak to that? Um, I feel like, uh, I mean, I, I'd say that the more you understand uh, process from both sides of the aisle, so to speak, um, the the better uh, you'll be able to communicate intention and understand what you can accomplish given the circumstances. You know that um, I think it is important to. I mean, you may not be the best electrician in the world, but you should certainly understand the basics of electricity, and I, I think you should spend time hanging lights and and sort of getting that under your belt it's just like um it's in order to really understand the tools i feel like you have to work with them in an intimate way more than just putting them on a plot and seeing how they work in the air but um actually spending some time um being an electrician i think is valuable i mean i i, I mean i haven't done that in a while and you know and i work in the theater a lot um and i go near a lighting instrument usually the union stage hands get very nervous <laughs> They try to keep me away, away from things. You know, I used to be, look, look, I, I used to do all of that. Uh, I, I was a TD. I built scenery. I welded scenery. Um, you know, I, the reason I, I focus lights uh, with a welding plate right here, here it is, my uh, number 11 welding shield yeah. is because of uh, all the TIG and MIG welding I did uh, when I was in grad school. I really learned. I said, wow, this would be a great thing to use during a focus. So. I, I think the more you understand about process, it, it just enriches um, your experience and makes you a better designer. But I think ultimately uh, you have to dream big and don't um, limit your imagination based on how hard a task might be. You really have to uh, sort of separate yourself from that and do what's right and necessary for the production and for your particular vision. Um, so that's a, a tricky line to tread, I think. But and, and piggybacking right on that, I think there's something to be said as a designer where if an electrician's up a ladder and they're having trouble solving a problem, you can either intuit what that problem is, either the, oh, you know, the lenses are knocking together or that light's not going to make it past that and, and you, you understand that. But also, if you know that there's a there's a, a, a person up a stick ladder for 15 minutes and, and you know, you gotta, uh, you're waiting on a piece of gel or you're, there's some delay or something, it's like, Hey, why don't we get that that person down from there? You know, right? Because it's you, you don't want a crew at the end of the day going, "Oh man, I stood up there for twenty minutes and he didn't even need me." Uh, it's a sensitivity of that that really, once you get the crew on their, your side, problems can get solved more easily. Uh, the converse is true as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just something <laughs> understand. You know, understand how hard these these folks are working, and uh, and and you know, the, your. They're the ones. If they care as much about your work as as you do, then the product will get will get a lot better. So it will stay, and it'll stay better. I, I definitely agree, and I think to add to that, it it um, makes the um, relationship with your electrician as a designer much smoother because if they feel like they can speak to you in and, and you're actually going to understand what they're going through and what they have to do to fix an issue or to uh, accomplish something that you would like to achieve, then um, I just think that that, that makes um, for an easier process overall. Great. Great. Broderick, Broderick has a question, and I just want to say I've seen Don Holder carrying Altman 360 Qs up and down straight ladders a lot. <laughs> so and we worked together at George Tree Playhouse when we used to yeah. sling ladders <laughs> like they were going like in yeah. we, the way we use ladders in that space. I remember was pretty insane. Yeah, Broderick. <laughs> yes, uh, I believe Mr. Uh, Goldman answered my question. Well, my question was. 
um, do through the creative process of designing, how often do you think um, of your technicians in, in terms of labor and just, you know, pretty much how they put on the show? But he answered my question. And, um, <laughs> well, but also, I, I, I think about it all the time because I, when I'm working on uh, shows that aren't necessarily theatrical, it's my job to help specify how much crew we're going to need. So if I'm putting up a corporate uh, corporate design and it's got truss and a bunch of moving lights, you know, it'll be like, oh, is that uh, is that six electricians or is it twelve electricians? Is it a two uh, is it two ten hour days? So you really get a sense of that. Normally, your production electrician will chime in on that, but when when a producer, we got to keep this under <clears throat> under this budget and we have this time frame to do it. You've got to you've got to kind of kind of got to know how quickly this will do. And it's the same thing goes for when you're focusing a plot too. Okay. How quickly you can move. Yeah, though I might add, um, a lot of times when you're designing plays, especially on Broadway with limited crews, um, you have to consider how a show is going to be not only focused but maintained. I mean, if you think about it, you could have a massive uh, light plot in a theater, and then once the show opens, th the show crew consists of one electrician and maybe a flyman, but probably not. And maybe a sound person, but probably not. The electrician is probably running sound and lights. And then you have a, a carpenter and you have a house electrician who turns on the house lights. And that's your crew. So you have to think about, okay, if something goes wrong at six, between 6.30 and 7 or 7, 6.30 and 7.30 when the house opens, is, that, is it possible to maintain my, my show? And you literally, the more you understand how how to focus a light, how to maintain equipment, how to create accessible lighting positions, the, the, more, uh, the, the, the greater the integrity will be in terms of your design, in, in terms of the preservation of your design. If you don't think about it, um, or you don't have the background to consider what your options are, um, the work can be compromised. It's, it, it sounds like a real peripheral, but it's actually, crucial depending on what kind of environment you're working in so the more you understand about the technical technical end of things the, the better your work ultimately can be so i have a question for you don yeah uh, along those along that line so considering um maintaining a show how much redundancy do you build into a big production like the lion king you know do you do you, how much do you consider if you know these moving lights here go out i need something else to take its place like how how do you work on that well on a, on a musical you usually don't have to worry as much because the crews are a lot bigger um you know there's usually maybe two to three to four in the case of lion king there are four follow spot operators and you know there's several deck electricians so on a on a musical with a large crew show then there's more many more people in the theater to assist with the mate you know the everyday maintenance and the pre-show maintenance so there's less usually of an issue um and in lion king uh all the you know all the positions can either fly in or uh, they're accessible in some way the front of house in the lion king at the minskoff theater for example is uh is in, on the front of house lighting is all in accessible locations you can walk to the positions or climb down to the position so it's possible to maintain the show without double hanging but that's a really good question i mean when it comes to plays if you have a front of house truss let's say and you have some key specials or moving lights um you may want to consider doubling up those fixtures because um it could be that on a Wednesday matinee day, the crew comes in, a lamp is out, they don't have any time or any fly person to fly the truss in, and either you have the a second light plugged into the same circuit or whatever, or uh, you know you have to go a performance or two before that gets fixed. So um, that's something. It's, it's usually you usually think more about that when the positions are inaccessible and the crew sizes are small on musicals like the lion king uh there's usually plenty of help plenty of people to maintain stuff so fortunately i that's not one of the things i had to think about too much there are plenty of others but <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh, there's uh, i think mitchell's got a question mitchell if you'd like to ask that 
Yeah, I'm just curious, since we're talking about like budgeting and trying to make things fit in whatever your time or budget allotment is, how do you actually start to turn that into a real number? How do you look at your plot and say, oh, shoot, I've drafted way too much front of house. We're never going to hang that in time or focus that in time. What do you consider? What factors do you put in to actually get a real number out of that? Uh, I mean, who wants That's to answer that one? Now. You've got way more. <laughs> um, well, you know, there's there's a, I mean, Dave Linskin could probably talk uh, more uh, eloquently about this, but I, I can say, I can say that, uh, you know, there's a pretty sim simple calculation when it comes to the, the rental costs that you can use. I mean, basically on, well, on commercial productions anyway, when it comes to Broadway, let's say, um, everything is calculated based on a, a 100 week recoup of the investment. In other words, um, and so for example, let's say you uh, buy 200 or your production rental list is $200. Then the shop will say, okay, the, the value of this equipment that this person has put on their equipment list is $200. If I if I divide that 200 by 100 weeks, which is when I hope to recoup the money I spent <clears throat> on this gear, that means I'm going to charge $2 a week for that rental. So, I mean, that's the simplest way I can describe it to you. So if you have a $2 million lighting package, <clears throat> that means um, theoretically your uh, rental cost would be what? 20,000 a week, $20,000 a week. Mm -hmm. Now, it's usually not twenty thousand dollars a week because other things come into play, like um, who the show, what the show is. You know, for example, like uh, when P Harry Potter, I'm sure the the lighting package was millions and millions of dollars, but it was heavily discounted because they knew the shops knew that they were going to get their money back. So there are intervening factors. But the, the rough calculation is divide the value of the equipment you're using by 100. Um, however, you know, in terms of how much time it takes uh, to focus a front of house or whether you're gonna use, you haven't have too much or not enough equipment in the front of house, that's all about um, preparation. I mean, that, that you really need to think, you can't think about the budget in that way. I think what you gotta do is design the show and then go back and uh, if necessary, make those reductions if you find out that you don't have enough money to uh, pay for it. In other words, I, I'm, I'm of the belief that I, de I designed the production the way I feel it should be designed, of course, with a pragmatic point of view, but uh, ultimately I don't think too much about dollars and cents like right up front when I'm putting pencil to paper, so to speak. I mean, it's th that's tricky. I mean, you, the more shows you do, I think the, the clearer, <clears throat> And more accurate sense you'll you'll get of how much it's going to cost, um, and the only way to do that is to I, I think ultimately just do a lot of show, just keep working and uh, yeah. and and you'll learn it you, you'll you'll get you'll figure it out eventually. The, the Broadway economy is a really weird beast because not only are these rental shops not only do these want, rental shops want to say oh we're doing we're doing Don Holder's next show, but they're also saying oh is this going to tour? You know, it's I, if if they could have predicted what they probably could have predicted what Lion King was going to do, and they probably would have given that first light plot for free, knowing how many companies are out now. Uh, I think it's nine. <laughs> well, there's actually two that are running right Couple. now in Japan. <laughs> Amazingly, the only, but, but, only two. you know, uh, so uh, you know, giant companies like PRG and Four Wall will will certainly look take the long view, especially with producers that have had a run of success or uh, Disney or, you know, anything like that there. Uh, so that's different math. Um, I think for uh, early in your career, you're going to end up working in theaters where you're going to say, what do you have for lights? And someone's going to say, we got 20 Lecos and 30 park hands and two moving lights and a ETC ion or an ETC express. And <clears> then <throat> you're going to call some friends and be like, do you have any park hands in your garage? Or did you use all the lights in the theater that you're working at this week? Uh, and your friends will be like, I, I've got these birdies. And you'll be like, great, those will be fa fantastic footlights. Um, you know, and, and, but you'll start figuring that out and you'll start figuring out your own economy 
<clears throat> based on the size of a little of the smaller theaters and the, the different venues you go into and whether they're regional theaters that have an, uh, an electrician attached to them who's like, here's what our list is, but we haven't really looked at these strip lights in a couple of years. So it says 12, but count on only having 10 of them, you know, and, and you'll, you'll and, and they'll say, we do have a small rental budget. Usually it covers gel, but maybe you can get two moving lights or maybe you'll call your friends at ETC and say, I hear they, there's a new high end uh, moving light out and I'd really like to try it. <clears throat> and be able to talk about it and maybe you'll get someone to loan you one for three weeks. So, uh, so Michael's got a question, but before we do that, uh, uh, Slu, just in piggybacking on what you just said, Don and, and Herrick, um, you know, to the effect of you've got all these tours that are out there and they're running for 10 years, you know, why not purchase the lighting package instead of renting it? Um, well, a lot of uh, a lot of long running tours do purchase the lighting package, um, but sometimes you know theater is, is quite um, you know it's an uncertain. It, it's very uh, what's the word? Uh, you know, it's it's uh, <laughs> speculative. Let's put it that way. It's you know it's a very speculative industry. So unless you're you have a there's very few guarantees in life, and certainly in crystal ball. So yeah. a lot of people aren't going to. Uh, you know, be willing to take that risk unless it's a really sure thing. So, um, you know, the Lion King often uh, now these companies that are going out, the newer companies, they're they're purchased right up front. Um, th there's they don't get rented, but I think in, in in most cases, companies will not take be willing to take that risk because it's a huge financial. Uh, uh, investment. I mean, a, a lighting package for a typical music, you know, a large musical could be, you know, three, four million dollars worth of equipment. Um, the only other thing I'll say, you know, just piggybacking on what Herrick mentioned, I, when I'm doing little shows and and I have to pay for the lights, I mean, if you figure what a Leco is going to be about, um, or what a, a Luster two, if you if you want to rent one of those, is probably going to be. It used to be that Leco was about five to ten dollars a week. Maybe I have seven dollars in my head, but I think that's the late nineties. <laughs> right. Whereas a, a luster is probably going to be what twenty, twenty, twenty bucks a week. I mean, I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing that rough calculation, and a moving light is anywhere from fifty, depending on what you rent, is going to be fifty to a hundred dollars a week. I would say. I mean, though, there's no guarantee that that's what it's going to be, but they're nice numbers to sort of, you know, just sort of think about. They'll they'll give you a rough idea about what. The package might be might cost if it's not really discounted or you don't have a lot of friends in the lighting shop or connections um that's a good number to to work with but also and and actually and and a, a trick here is look you might want you might know exactly what you want you might want the the brand new thing that maybe you saw at ldi when when next you get to go there or that you read about or you saw at usitt and or you want the luster twos and you talk to your rental person and just say, you know, how much for this? And they'll say, well, that's $5,000 a week and you've got $800 a week to do it. You're like, well, okay. A lot of times the rental person will say, well, what do you have? And you say, don't be afraid. They're not going to try and like steal from you. Say, look, I've got 800 bucks a week. And they'll say, well, we've got luster ones or we've got, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me, ETC. What's the, uh, What's the what's the lower luster? We got some color source fixtures. Color sources, you know, whatever. But those <laughs> lower <ones>. luster. <laughs> David just turned. David just turned his head. He went. The poor man's luster. Lower right? quality. I was trying not to use the word lower quality. Uh, anyway, but uh, but they've got they've got a ton of stuff on the shelves. And and what happens with rental companies is two years ago they bought the new hot thing, which was in this case it's probably Sharpies five years ago because somebody wanted ten thousand Sharpies on a rock tour. And now PRG and Secaucus is sitting on 4,000 of them and nobody wants them anymore because there's something better that's come out. But you can get those for, you know, $15 a week. So suddenly your, your little rock and roll musical might be able to get eight Sharpies upstage, which are going to be a really useful thing. The color temperature is going to be terrible and it's going to have some problems. Uh, but that's just something you're going to have to solve and, and it's it might help your design. It, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. 
I would also add really quickly to the the renting versus purchasing. Um, for some uh, repertory dance company like Ailey, there are things that it may be beneficial to purchase that we are going to always be touring with, like the dance towers or you know certain elements of a rig that can be purchased. But the rig itself will change depending on what we're taking out on tour that particular year but but there are small items or maybe not so small items that that could potentially be beneficial to purchase for a company gotcha like a barbecue grill that's important yes. right, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole road box of spices yeah there you go there you go um so uh michael had a question so let's go to michael uh so hopefully my audio is all right if i turn off my picture yep. your audio is good yeah Great. Um, so I actually had sort of a, a combo question. The first one being, I'm someone who does have a lot of experience in electrician. I'm actually a journeyman with IATSE 122. Um, and I wonder if you think there's a point where you really need to, where you need to be leery of who you work for as an electrician so that they don't box you into that space. Um, and, and how much, you know, if, if you want to be careful with that, or if you don't think it matters, like, in my experience, I worked with Old Globe, and after working with him as an electrician, I had to do some free assist. I was able to become an assistant there, but I don't know how standard that is. Uh, <clears throat> and then, and, and uh, that sort of connected to that is uh, working as a lighting director. It, like, um, I, I did actually spend the last year working as a lighting director for Los Angeles Dance Project. Uh, as their touring lighting director, and but I've never got anywhere near an opportunity to design, and I definitely for them was definitely put in that spot of oh you know you are a lighting director. Now for that move to design, you know what do you think the pitfalls are there? What are the things to avoid in that practical experience world? Um. Uh. I got it if any, nobody else wants. Um, I, there's, you should always be self-advocating for yourself. Uh, that was redundant, but you should always self-advocate. <laughs> don't, be don't be afraid to do that. Uh, if you are an excellent le electrician, you're gonna stay an excellent electrician unless you find a way to break out of that. You may, that may mean you purposefully take a break or, or you know, find a touring company that's going through and you hear that uh, they're, you know, so one of their assistants is leaving or something. And, and, and uh, you've got, and also as a, there are a lot of touring companies that need electricians who are also LDs because you have to focus the plot as well and, and deal with stuff like that. So that might be an upgrade. Uh, something I was lucky enough to do at the ART was uh, Jim Ingalls was designing uh, two shows in rep. And, and again, because John Ambrosoni, who was the, he was the lighting director slash head electrician there and uh, he was in the same same boat as what we're talking about. I told him that I wanted to be a lighting designer. Or I was a lighting designer, and uh, he said, "Well, make sure you sit behind Jim at the tech table when you're not, you know, when you're not in the middle of focus, and I'll introduce you." And you know, Jim is an incredibly gracious guy, and uh, and I was able to ask a few questions. Don't you know, a hundred questions is too many, but just watch and watch the pattern of tech and all that, and uh, and. You know, and but people around you will be like, oh, you know, Michael's like, he sort of understands what's going on at the tech table because somebody's going to roll through and be like, you know, my assistant had to go off on another show or couldn't make it into town. And they're like, you know, that electrician we have seems to be pretty good and understand what a magic sheet is or, you know, uh, something like that. And I, I think that's a that's a realistic path. Um, you know, programming is also another another step up, but can also lead you in different ways. You know, if you become an ace programmer, you may never, well, for theater, you, you might never be the head lead lighting designer, but yeah, you're gonna make some money and you're gonna get to sit at a lot of tech tables and do some really wonderful things. Um, so, you know, don't be curious afraid of that. Sorry. I'm curious how Roya would answer that question too. Roya, you've been touring with Alvin Ailey for 10 years, I mean, how are you holding up with that? How am I holding up? 
Um, as for the, the portion of the question about being a lighting director, I, I don't know that, I mean, I think that there are so many different um, paths that you can take. When you decide to become a lighting designer, it can manifest in so many different ways. You can, like Herrick said, you can be a programmer. And a lot of times if you you find a good relationship with a lighting designer, that programmer LD relationship is also an incredibly creative role um, and you are often part of that design process um, and I think similarly with a lighting director there is um, still a creative element to um, maintaining the integrity of each design that you're remounting and understanding how to um, you know when you have to do it with half the number of lights that it was originally designed with you know it, it um, I think has its own, uh, those can be their own paths and they don't necessarily have to be stepping stones to being a designer. Um, but, um, and, and to jump on a little bit of what Herrick was saying, I also think that if you are working as an electrician for a show and, um, you know, I think that you can also use it as an opportunity to go up to the associate or the designer and say, Hey, I'm on the call today, but I'm off tomorrow. Do you mind if I come and sit behind the tech table and watch? And so even though you're they're seeing you as a electrician, if you communicate with those designers and say, this is something else I'm interested in, um, I think you'll find a lot of people are pretty open to that kind of thing. Very few um, lighting I'll designers bite. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I have to say that uh, I was a lighting supervisor on, for two uh, dance companies right out of graduate school. And, um, you know, I work really hard. And uh, I think that if, if an artistic director or whoever is the person who's making the decisions about hiring or assigning design slots to the new new dance works, um, if they see you um, that you're a, a quick decision maker, that you have a, a a strong creative sense and a really good work ethic, and you work well uh, under pressure, et cetera, et cetera, all the traits that you want to have and the intangibles that you look for in a lighting designer, you'll probably get that opportunity. I, I mean, I just think it's about uh, being patient. I often tell people who are just starting out in the industry, you know, remember it's uh, more of a marathon than it is a sprint. Um, so perhaps just, you know, keeping, uh, keeping your focus, working hard, um, making good decisions, doing impeccable work will ultimately land you where you need to, to land when it comes to working with dance companies. It, it did for me. And I have to say, I learned more as a lighting supervisor for small modern companies and taking them on the road than I did almost anywhere else. And it, and it, it was so beneficial in every aspect of my work in the theater. I mean, I, I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything. I would also say that as a lighting director or lighting supervisor of a dance company, there are often opportunities to, um, if you have, if there, the, there's an event or a gala or something, a uh, festival, um, that could be an opportunity for you're there, you're the lighting supervisor. Okay. Design the gala. Um, and then that can be a segue into them seeing right. you in that role and, totally. and you, you for new works. Anything to show you off? Uh, Hannah has a question. Let's go to you next. Okay. Um, can can you guys talk a little bit about how you prepare a show to go on tour from a design standpoint and to that end also how a show goes internationally while maintaining your original design and like who who is drafting the plot in the space that they're going to next? Like how does that work? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I could speak a little bit to that. Uh, I, I think for uh, it, you know, designing for tours is a is it's that's a long conversation. I mean, we could spend two hours just just talking about the, that. Um, At a session here. <laughs> um, but uh, in terms of national tours, I mean that's a that's a good question. The remember that the we, we what we normally assume is that the foot because the footprint of the stage space 
is going to remain constant no matter what theater you travel to. You can pretty much, if you plan <clears throat> accordingly, you can pretty much assume that everything upstage of the plaster line, uh, in terms of all your lighting positions, et cetera, are going to be consistent from venue to venue, assuming you have, um, you know, a good production team working on the show. So the, the, you, you plan your production in that way in terms of plaster line upstage. Of course, there's going to be, you know, some situations where there are a few decisions that have to be made, but most of the, I would say 90% of the decision making has to do on a national tour or international tour has to do with the front of house. Like how is, uh, how are the front of house positions going to be adapted um, for your particular show? If it's in a show like the Lion King or some of the larger national tours, Hamilton, Wicked, uh, they have enough clout that they can uh, have what's called an advanced package and an advanced um, install. So that means that the show actually travels with, like in the case of The Lion King, uh, basically a second, almost an entire jump production that travels ahead of the actual production that's playing. So that means the next city there's an advanced team that's hanging the front of house that's putting in a lot of the onstage gear and infrastructure before the show arrives. And that saves money because that means they can open sooner after closing in the previous city. But uh, so in a, on a large show, the front of house also remains fairly constant because the production carries a front of house truss and rigs it in more or less the same relationship to the proscenium or plaster line on smaller tours like um you know non-equity tours or tours that maybe sit in a city for a few days or a week um the touring electricians have to make a lot more decisions so um, as a lighting designer and an associate you have to give them um the resources and the information to make executive decisions from city to city. For example, some some theaters don't have cove positions. They don't have trust. They certainly don't have trusses. So a lot of national tours, you have to uh, assume that there are two box booms in the front of house and a balcony rail. And that's how you have to light your your uh, production from the front, from downstage to the plaster line. Um, in some other cities, there may be a cove. Um, so you need to give the electrician the information they need to uh, adapt from one city to next, that, to the next. That's part of your process. And uh, the other, the only other thing I'll say, with, because it's going to be a belabored conversation, is that front of house is normally kept to the bare minimum because everything is about focus time. So I, I usually um, follow the rule that, with the exception of a show like The Lion King, there's no more than. 30 to 40 focusing units in the front of house, probably less than 30 is ideal, um, but no more than 50. And uh, moving lights, you can't really hang them except perhaps on an accessible position like a balcony rail. So front of house is kept to <clears> our <throat> minimum. On stage is where you put your firepower because that's easier to rig. It's gonna be consistent from city to city. Like I said, we could go on and have this conversation for hours, but I think I'll, I'll leave it at there. <laughs> it, it's a little slightly different for us in a repertory dance sort of situation because uh, we're essentially, when we prep a package for tour, it's um, about 15 to 20 different ballets that we're trying to stick in one light plot. And so we have to keep that in mind when we are creating new works, um, during our each winter season. Um, and there are restrictions that we give designers and we want them to be able to be flexible um, and create something amazing, but we also have to be realistic and know that we're gonna have to fit all of this onto one lighting trap uh, when we take it on tour. So there is a little bit of negotiating when it comes to, uh, you know, big items or big things, whole systems that they're adding to our rep plot. You know, we try and keep the number of specials down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, definitely what Don was saying about front of house, that's the, the largest changing thing. Um, and for us internationally, it's, um, um, we often use house equipment. So that is a much bigger, 
uh, translation than anywhere we tour uh, domestically because we travel with our own package here in the U.S. And um, when we go overseas, then it's often using uh, very unfamiliar equipment um and you know the, the a lot of the theaters in europe a lot of the opera houses have these huge portals downstage portals and so it shoves your whole dance floor upstage five feet six feet um and so there's a lot of other things that um uh we're trying to um, adjust for in those instances um i think you asked who who normally draws the light plot as well at least at ailey it's me as the associate lighting director doing the light plot and translating all of that but i imagine it varies from company to company and if you want the extreme uh the, the if, if we're playing the three bears uh i'm i'm I don't know which bear I am at this point, but uh, <laughs> then you end up going to Brazil and doing nine shows in something like 14 days in nine different cities and every venue and, and the, the, the acrobats you're touring with, uh, they, they're, the only thing you're traveling is like a Grand Amé light. And, uh, and I think that's all we were tour touring with. And, uh, and every venue has something different and you've gotten lists of equipment that are mostly in Portuguese. And uh, you just kind of roll in as early in the morning as you can. You go, oh, this is what that is. And you've got the show programmed in the console. And now you start cloning like a mad person. And uh, and you just gonna and, and your associate starts talking to the follow spot operators uh, with the five words of Portuguese that she's learned. And um, and then you have a show at seven o'clock. And it's it's great. It's just you know you hope the hazer works. <laughs> but it's, it's fun. But it's it's definitely. Um, you come out of that going, oh, I can do anything anywhere now. This is great. Uh, you learn a lot of swear words in Portuguese. That's that's great. Uh, Phil's raising his hand. Phil, Phil, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, first of all, Herrick, if you ever need somebody who knows more than five words, uh, I'm Brazilian. I do speak Portuguese. <laughs> 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 and the swear words. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Um, my, my question is uh, to all three of you, since because um, we kind of, you know, you guys introduced yourself as um, obviously primarily dance and theatrical designers, but obviously you, uh, you, you know, done architectural and stuff like that. My big question is um, when you go about um, kind of dipping your feet into architectural and at that point you need like, you know, you're a business name and LLCs and all that stuff. Like, can you guys talk about like that process of actually like, not just coming in as a freelance designer, but as like a start of a firm. Uh, Eric, yeah, I, guess, I guess it's me, huh? <laughs> um, I uh, actually, I started my company in 2006 because I was being hired. I had to be in two places at once and the state of New York decided in and around 2005 that you couldn't just be a 1099 employee anymore. And, I, and let me know if I need to explain that. Uh, but it meant that no matter what we did, uh, the state was going to take taxes out of my my fee. So if I went and worked for five hundred dollars a day for somebody uh, like PRJ it was fourth phase at the time, uh, I was going to make two hundred and fifty dollars back because the federal government was going to think, oh, you're making five hundred dollars a day every day. So here's your pittance. But I at the same time had hired uh, my associate Diana to go uh, cover another show and I owed her. $250 because I was making $500 off that show too, or something like that. But there was no way I was going to be able to pay her until it just, so I, I, I incorporated, which meant I was able to invoice and say, both of you pay me $500 as soon as you can. And then I was able to pay Diana and I'll pay myself eventually. That's what made me incorporate. Uh, it helps me because I carry insurance. Uh, it helps because when you present as a corporation, you present as a team. Uh, and, and we have a bunch of people who work with us now as uh, Roya and Al Crawford work together on their larger larger shows. Uh, but also because we have relationships, uh, you know, I'll call Roya and be like, hey, are you available two weeks from today? And she'll be like, I don't know, let me ask Al. <laughs> and, and sometimes both of us will text Al and he'll be like, yeah, just, you're whatever. Uh, and, uh, and, but we, but we're all friends and it's a really tight industry and I know the capabilities of people. Uh, and so if I have six, pro six projects drop on me in the next couple of weeks, I can field them. Uh, and I know that I have payroll set up and I have workers comp insurance 
uh, and I have all of that. And uh, when a client says we need your insurance, it's like, yep, here you go. Uh, and I know how to subcontract people uh, and where to get labor. Um, it just, it's a very, for me, it was a very organic process. I didn't set out to own a company. Um, and and the only lighting designer I knew who owned a company when I really started was Ken Billington. He had KB Associates. Um, and, but there are companies in our industry like Light Switch and like, like Arc3 Design uh, that are really doing great work and, and have a wonderful coterie of designers. So. so also incorporating uh, protects you in terms of personal liability. <clears throat> I mean, we're, we live in a very litigious world and let's say a light falls, whatever you specify, something falls on a passerby and they sue for millions of dollars. And unless you, if you're incorporated, you can protect yourself. Um, no amount of insurance could isolate your personal finances and per whatever your personal life from professional liability if you're not uh incorporated so incorporation is kind of essential if um you're working as an independent person on other than projects where you're uh, insured by somebody else um, so architectural lighting is a perfect example. I mean, you know, if a scaffolding falls or something falls on somebody, the lawyers are going to go after everybody, including you, to to um, get their money. Um, so you want to protect yeah. yourself. Yeah, and you, 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 you folks, sorry, Don, go ahead. No, that's uh, it. Okay. Uh, you folks should be very aware. Like, when I was in my 20s, there were some stupid things I did. I... I lit haunted houses and things you know i was up a ladder with a makita and some wood screws and no washers and screwing a leco into a one by three and i was like oh that'll be great and uh that's not and and maybe that world was a little a little easier then uh that is not the case now you need you know and you can see it everywhere you need somebody at the bottom of your genie lift pushing you around you can't be on a rolling ladder on the stage pulling yourself across by holding onto the grid which i'm pretty sure several people in this call have done uh you know it's just just safety first and and it's just not none of it's worth it like really safety first and covid is making this much more important and that's why there's all this conversation about liability protection for producers and theaters and movie theaters and uh the unions are very concerned about that because producers leave after shows especially in in the film industry you know get the shot done and then go away but if two weeks later half the crew is sick uh there's a there's a liability that they need to they need to have taken the precautions and they can't just nod at precautions whether it's People on the bottom of a genie lift, uh, or or using safety cables, or COVID tests, uh, and just just be aware and don't get. I just don't want to see anybody here, you know, have a light fall on somebody's head, and and because you did something fast and you thought, oh, it's just me, and and I'm just going to do this, it'll be fine. Um, yeah, it's yeah. It, just be aware of it. it just to, and I just wanted to touch on that actually because I, I live in the architectural world about eighty percent of the time and. Um, you know, architectural lighting design, architectural lighting uh, and control systems design. And I, and I was a theater consultant for 10 years. And I think a lot of that uh, got, became ingrained in me, you know, as far as liability is concerned and making sure that we carried insurance and making sure that we had an attorney and an accountant who, who would look at all of these things and how we were structured. And, and, you know, if a light fell on someone's head, did it go to the company and then did it get to my company and then did it get to me and my family and could they come and take my house and what was that whole situation so i mean there was a lot to there was a lot to consider there so i you know i think we could spend a, another two hour session on on just this uh but yeah. uh that that's a that's a really good question just just make sure you're doing the smart things like eric said and uh and and try to protect yourself uh and don't sure. be afraid to ask like just just ask uh, senior people in our industry that you know like you can, you can always email me uh, just don't especially if it's a safety thing you know if you and if you have to ask it's probably uh, you probably want to take some sort of precaution you know um i have a question yeah uh go for it uh so my question to 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 all uh, four of you um so i know that we're talking about a lot about business uh, how do you manage your time with business and being a creative at the same time like 
what is the process in that terms? Uh, do as little business as possible. <laughs> I just I just want to sit in a dark room and turn on lights. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agree. Yeah, it's 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 a necessary <clears throat> evil. Uh, I have not my company is not big enough yet to have a uh, a manager, you know, or a, an office manager or a, an HR department or anything like that. And uh, myself and my associate Kara uh, uh, do uh, do a lot of that. Uh, and we just try and you know, if if I'm not getting out and designing, then I'm just going to stop. Just, there's no I'm not here to run it company i'm here to design and it's nice that we have other designers out doing things and i can send other people out and keep them busy but uh, i'm doing i'm doing the if there's no work and the phone rings i'm doing the first thing and i'm bringing everybody else along that i can it's okay you should always learn to learn to delegate early <laughs> uh, you know it's all about i mean you know i think when you first start out as a young designer it's delegating is very hard, at least from my experience. You know, you, you do everything yourself and then you have no time for life or anything. Um, so learn how to use help and organize things so that people can work for you and with you and don't take everything on as your own personal burden. Um, that's or else, uh, you know, I mean, that's the healthier way to live. But it's but it's hard to do, especially when you're when you're first starting out. And when you're first starting out, you may not have the luxury, like Herrick said, to have like a, an operations person. So maybe what I find is easiest is to create a system for yourself um, that will allow you to process those more admin businessy things much faster and you're not wasting time on it so that you can get it in and get it out and actually focus on creating. And uh, I mean, this has nothing to do with business, really, but it's just a, you know, a, a word of caution. Understand what your sort of physical and emotional and work limitations are. Don't um, overextend yourself, uh, especially early in your career. You don't take on don't take on so much work that you can't do it well. You know, less is more. Um, and if you're doing everything yourself, then you just can't do as much. I mean, it's important to work as much as you possibly can to uh, build um, relationships and uh, get your work out there. But uh, be careful about doing too much because then everything will suffer and that could be detrimental to your future prospects. So you have to acknowledge that and be cautious. Learn how to say no. It's something that I, I, it took a long time for me to figure out how to do. Well, Don, that was actually one of my questions for later on. So now I don't have to ask that, that question. <laughs> well, I could ask it anyway. Let the other artists talk about it. I mean, how just... often did you say no? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, Mitchell's got a question. And Mitchell, maybe you can combine your two questions there uh, you, since you're talking about unions and, and things. Yeah. Um, so talking about joining. I guess my fear with joining the union is I pay my dues, I get in, and then all of the union work dries up. So how do you know when it's the right time to join the union and that you're not just going to pour all this money into it and then not get hired into the union afterwards? Um, and then second question, thinking back to like the first time you guys had a, a big gig, your first scary thing, for me, one of the biggest things is like leveling up to that next step in my career, I guess, working at the next level. How did you adapt to doing your first big scary show or working with a whole bunch of unions? What prep work did you have to do within yourself to like be ready to walk onto your first Broadway stage or something like that? Um, the, I, I'll answer the first part first. Uh, the, the, the question about union membership. I mean, you know, joining the union does not preclude you from doing any work that you want to do. You know, unlike Actors Equity or some of the other unions, um, Membership in the United Scenic Artists doesn't restrict you or limit you to take on anything you want. Um, the, with, you know, there are certain um, places you work that have union jurisdiction and you have to work under, you have to be a union member and work under a union contract like the Metropolitan Opera or Broadway or lots of film and television. But um, you can do an off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, whatever showcase production 
for no money for a hundred bucks or whatever it is. And um, still not the United Senior Guards is fine with that. Um, in fact, you can um, get a job that is typically not a union job and um, make an arrangement with the producer to pay pension and welfare. In other words, pay your union benefits as part of your agreement um, for a non-union, non-union jurisdiction. So uh, I think it's all, the only see, uh, thing I see for in terms of union membership are good things. I mean, you, uh, you're you working, they have a very good pension program. They have, uh, you can get health insurance. Um, there's a lot of good reasons to join the union. Um, it's not going to limit you. It's not going to affect your, your ability to work. However, that it may not be necessary until you're, you're ready. I mean, I, I think you'll know when you're ready to join, when you need to join the union. It could be that you get hired to do a Broadway show or a commercial project as an assistant or a designer, and you have to join. You just pay the fee and you join. Or you're just doing working with a certain group of people or working on certain projects and you get the sense that based on the way your career is going, now is the time to join. I wouldn't rush it. It's not crucial uh, to be a member. It's not going to limit you one way or the other. Um, but it, there's a lot of benefits to, to union membership. Also, correct and correct me if I'm wrong, folks. Uh, nobody's. I, I've never seen, there's, there's no USA 829 steward that is going to, stand at the door and be like, I need to see your card. No. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that Don's principal associates are union, but sometimes I know he's got a very large tech table. Uh, is it, how far, how are, do you occasionally have non-union assistant assistants? Yeah, and that, that, I get in trouble from the union. You know, the, I, the union complains to me, not to the people who I hire. Right, right. So, um, <laughs> so you'll know, but then you'll yeah, know, and you'll be so. like, hey, look, I'm working with Don Holder, and uh, you know, and we're doing two Broadway shows this year, and 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 I should sign up for the union, and Don's going to call and say, look, I need this guy, right, Don? <laughs> well, um. I should do that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, sometimes I hire uh, interns or, or people who are non-union, which I really shouldn't do. But there's no I just don't feel like there's enough in place in terms in terms of uh, opportunities for young uh, sort of up and coming assistants who are in the in the union to get that experience. So I sort of create opportunities when I can. Um, the union kind of just looks at me and says, I can't believe you're doing this. Don't, we don't want to hear about it or words to that effect. And then, but you're right, Herrick, they don't, I've never heard yeah. of them actually. And it's even, it's a problem in that, you know, there, there, there are shows that come into Broadway without union designers and they just sneak in under the wire and they're, they're gone, but it's usually the holiday shows. And it, it's sort of a thorn in my side because I've been called to, to do those shows. And then it's like, Oh, so-and-so took it. And it's like some, some person you've never heard of who's definitely not union and they're and they're gone, you know. And it's well, that's a, that's a different thing. I, I don't think totally that's right. Thing. But it's another it's another side of a coin. Uh, you know, the union the union tries; they do very good things. Uh, but it's not. You know, don't <laughs> agonize over it. It'll it'll happen. Yeah, it'll happen. I mean, you, you'll know when 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 you're ready. But I, I wouldn't. It, it's being a union member or union membership doesn't sit or failing you god forbid you fail your union exam for the first time i, I don't you know jules fisher had to sue the united scenic artists to get in so uh and i think he did pretty well so you don't I, I don't put too much weight on union membership just remember it's just a a, a great way to as an independent person to have to sort of um start building some stability in your life in terms of health insurance minimum wages uh and uh a retirement fund that you're oh, not going to yes. get uh that you would normally only get by working with a corporation and you're <laughs> basically a gig employee you will be that's one, that's one thing that's really handy when you're young is the union puts out a union rate sheet that i think you can download or just just download from the 829 website about what a design fee is for a, a, a single set drama or a uh, multi-set musical and it, it'll say right there it's five hundred dollars or five thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars and so if you're going into a regional theater and you're like i don't know what my fee is you have a you have a bellwether you know about this is approximately what it is and 
you're not union, so you really don't have a leg to stand on, but you can at least say, look, this is, you know, and the producers, if you also know if the producers offer you, offer you half of that, you should probably walk away. Uh, but that's, it's, it's a resource that you can use, um, you know, and, and, and know what your worth is. So. Yeah. Roy, what about the second half of Mitchell's question, leveling up for the big, for the big oh, opportunity? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Um, Go ahead. Somebody else answer that. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't really know how to answer that. Um, uh, I can sort of. I mean, I I found that when my my biggest when when I I hit some milestones, some really large things, I just I took the time. Like you always take the time and draft the light plot, but there's there's that, and then there's like writing down what you think every cue is going to be like every like channel values potential channel values like just having it it's like anything else rehearsing it just coming super prepared um we had a as a as a team we had a one day uh a one day broadway benefit on the the stage of jersey boys doing uh the who's tommy and it was you go in at sunday night at 7 p.m and you have four hours of work and then you're back in the door at seven or eight a.m. and doors for the show are at 6 p.m. on that Monday. And the, the Who's Tommy musical has 27 musical numbers in it that are not insignificant. And uh, it, we had the entire uh, Howell Binkley Jersey Boys light plot to play with. And I had two programmers, uh, one of whom was my, my friend, Tommy Hay, who was uh, programming the, the moving lights. And the other was uh, the, the house electrician, uh, the house board op, who I can't remember, and he was wonderful. And we literally, I had lists of cues. I had conventional cues and moving light cues that uh, Tommy and my associate Susan and I had already gone over in my living room listening to the score for about a week. So I was on headset. I was cueing conventionals for one song while I was, because moving lights are inherently slower to cue. And I was, and I was cueing moving lights for, an entirely different song at the same time. And at one point the, the, the conventional board op said, wait, you just gave him Q 200 and I'm working on Q 500. And I said, yeah, don't worry about it. And he's like, wait, are you queuing two songs at the same time? And I said, yeah, we have the doors are at six tonight. And he said, oh, there was a pause. He said, okay. <clears throat> after we got through that one show, cause it only existed once, he came up and shook my hand. He said, I've never seen anybody do that in my life. But we took a week of just knowing and guessing with, with fortunately we had Howl's, you know, we had Howl's magic sheets, which were beautiful. And, and uh, uh, we had some cue lists that I had seen Jersey boys and I was like, okay, this is down to the downstage center group. And, and we had a clue, but it's, it was a whirlwind, but just prepare as best you can and know it inside and out. We knew what everything was going to look like. Yeah, I, I would agree with that preparedness and organization and, um, uh, aligning everything so that when you get in, you're not worried about the little things and you can, you can maintain your confidence and you're not thrown off by not knowing the answer to something or, or not being sure what you're doing. And there will be a whirlwind around you and the people around you will protect you from that. Uh, uh, Susan Nicholson was, uh, she was in charge of the front light follow spots uh, for that of which there were three who are some of the best on Broadway and uh, and our stage manager who was who had already done a show or two with us and was just nails. He knew where the cues were. We had done a paper tech with him two days before. And the only thing we ever did was cut cues during that that sort of tech process. So, you know, Susan would, would communicate that. And we, we went to doors and I was like, is this going to happen? We were like, I don't know. We'll see. You know, uh, it was great. But, that's great. We, we've got about 15 more minutes, guys. So we're going to uh, <laughs> maybe do uh, a couple more questions and then maybe we'll do a little speed round of some quick question answers. Um, but uh, I believe who was up? I think Melanie has been waiting to ask a question. So go for it. Melanie. Hi, I'm Melanie. Nice to meet you guys. Um, so my question pertains a lot to the conversation we were just having about unions. I think um, Herrick mentioned it briefly because in one of my classes, we've been looking at those designer rates and the union contracts and and what we should hold ourselves as designers up to. But my question is, right out of school, I feel like I don't have a lot of experience. I'm not very desirable to hire. How do I make sure that I'm 
not getting like cheated on a contract or how do I make sure that I'm pre-union getting a good contract without offending the person who's giving me the contract or without like stepping on anyone's toes to make sure like I'm being treated fairly, but I'm also not giving up an opportunity that might give me a good experience, you know? I think that that you can use those union rates as kind of an industry standard to use as a jumping off point with the understanding that a lot of the shows that you're likely to do just at the beginning are going to have much smaller budgets. So I think that if you can look at your fee and what you're being asked to do it for within the context of the larger budget, then that can help you decide the, uh, how fairly you're being treated as far as what other folks are getting paid. And then that's for you to decide if this is, well, this is what they have. This is the budget. Do I still want to do it or do I not? I, I think people will respect you if you respect yourself. So, I personally think, you know, I, I agree that uh, using the the collective bargaining agreements that are in place with the union, even though you're not in the union, that's a great place to start. You should be paid at least the minimum for whatever or something close to a minimum wage or scale uh, for whatever project you do. And if the producer is not willing to do that, um, then you have to decide whether you want to do the project. You know, how important is this project for you? Um, what are the other factors involved? Are there collab? You know, why are you doing the project? Is it because of the people you're working with? Then you may uh, have to make a decision where you're going to do it for less. But I don't think you should worry about hurting the producer's feelings by asking for what is justifiably due you for the amount of work you're going to put in. You should respect yourself and they will respect you. I guarantee it. Nobody's going to balk at you asking for a fair and reasonable wage based on precedence. I, I also think that it, it's, it gives you an opportunity to say to them, well, this is my normal rate. This is the fee that I expect to be paid. But if it's something that you really believe in, that you really want to be a part of, that you want to do, then maybe frame it as I will do this at a discounted fee. Right, but in but in the future, just know that this is normally what I work for, and yeah. especially before you agree to something like that. And I think you you said it a little bit. Uh, make sure that they can adequately produce your vision. Like if you're if you're going into a real theater and they've got two hundred lights for you and people to hang them and support you, that's great. But if they've got they're like we have five Lecos and you're doing no no Nanette, God God help you. Uh, uh, then you probably want to say no to that. Uh, I would want to be paid much more to do no, 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 than, uh, than much less. Um, yeah, and that's a choice. But if it's a passion thing, but also it depends on who's working on it. If it's a, a bunch of your peers who are young choreographers and young directors that you see talent in, you know, really go out of your way to work with them because they're the people <clears throat> that you're going to run into more and more and and you know it's it's the shotgun effect. If you if you make friends with twelve of them, two of them are going to succeed, and keep those relationships open, and and you're you'll you'll get there. Um, so great. Um, we we have one more question from Joy. If you'd like to go ahead, Joy. Oh, uh, my can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, my question is, like, when you hire assistant or intern, what kind of qualities do you looking for? And uh, how can we find an opportunity to work as an assistant? Um, what qualities do you look for? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I'm sure all of us could speak to that. I'll, I'll get started by saying that um, you're looking for, or I personally look for people who, um, I, I consider, first of all, I consider assistants partners in the process as opposed to people who are working for me, they're working with me. So I, 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 I kind of regard assistants as collaborators just as much as other collaborators. And, and therefore, they have to be people who I trust, who I um, 
who are self-starters, who are smart, who are empathetic to the design process, and who have the skills, the requisite skills to um, make a, a real contribution to what we're trying to create. Um, I think it's important for an assistant to be to have what it takes to step up to the plate and be a productive part of the process without us trying to carry him or her along um, and uh, take care of them <clears throat> instead of the assistant taking care of us, so to speak. So um, somebody who is good to work with, who's good to have in the room, who's responsible, who's intelligent, who has a lot of skills, and who is a self-starter, who doesn't need a lot of supervision, who can anticipate what is required instead of waiting for somebody to tell them what to do. You know, somebody who can, who is highly organized and um, who is highly responsible and is a good person, a good, you know, who can get along with everybody. Other than that, it's no problem. <laughs> That's all. That's all. I think I think we can teach each of us can teach our assistants and associates what we need from them. Uh, you 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 already probably have the tools. Uh, I'm looking for I look for a gregariousness and an ability to hold a conversation either with me or with the people around. Communicate easily. Um, again, self advocate. Uh, because times you're in the room uh, when I I'm called away, and uh, and you're in charge. And uh, and I just need you know don't be afraid if the director comes over and, and has a note or you know um, it just uh, yeah it's a lot of its personality and it's a lot of most lighting designers I know are um, oh what's the right I guess gregarious is the right word there are very few wilting flower lighting designers in fact I can't think of any um, so. <laughs> I would also say I think it's really beneficial as an assistant to be able to um, uh, hold multiple things at the same time, um, not literally, you know, but um, be able to focus on um, the details that you need to keep track of to support the vision and to support the project, but also be able to look at it with the bigger picture and anticipate what's coming next. I think that that's a... a skill that is really um, beneficial for assistants and associates. Wonderful. Uh, well, we've only got just a couple more minutes here. So as we are coming to our conclusion, I thought I would just try to ask a couple of quick questions and maybe you can give some quick answers uh, from from our mentors here. I'm calling this put I'm putting you on the spot since you're in the spotlight, no pun intended here. Um, and uh and let's see if you can answer these quickly so maybe 15 words or less you can be cryptic you can be you know however you'd like to answer these um but give us some sort of idea here um all of you and many you know we've all talked about when you started your career uh you may have had a mentor that taught you something and what would you say is the most influential thing a mentor maybe left with you or gave to you that you still carry with you today Roya. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um. Uh, oh God. No. <laughs> see on the spot. On the spot. On the spot. We'll, we'll come back. Go to Herrick. <laughs> uh, turn on the front light last. Hey, Don. Um, I don't know if I'm good at this, but. Jennifer Tipton always showed me that uh, you know, she learned everybody's name in the room within 10 minutes. And I, I always saw how that paid off. Wish I could do it. I guess, I guess the, the thing that keeps coming to mind is context. Always understand context of the room that you're in and the project that you're designing. Awesome. Uh, keys to success in a few words in our industry. Hard work. <laughs> Don't be a dick. <laughs> uh, um, I don't always succeed at that. I'll be the first to say it. I just 
just just be the be nice. It's, <laughs> everybody's everybody's under stress in a theater. So <clears throat> Here, here's uh, here's one where you can be cryptic if you feel like you need to be. Uh, describe very shortly and quickly the most embarrassing, horrifying moment that you've ever experienced in your career doing uh, doing what you're doing. <laughs> Don's thinking. Uh, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if it was the most How to summarize thing. This. Horrifying. I, it's just a f really quick anecdote. Um, and it's stayed with me when I was working with George Wolf, who, you know, I don't know if you know him, but most of you yeah. do. Uh, I used to say when I was in tech, I would say fading to black on stage. And of course, you know, George's companies were usually all African American and he would make fun of me and say, what are you saying? Fading to black on stage. And I'd say, no, going to dark. Anyway, he would always tease me about uh, using the um, expression, you know, and I would turn red faced and be so embarrassed. Um, so now I never say that ever. I always say fade to dark, going to dark on stage. All goes back to my early days at the public theater with George Wolf. Uh, um, I had a I had a hog three crash on me in the middle of a show in Peru. Uh, I had predicted it would happen eventually, and uh, and it did. And uh, fortunately, we covered it with follow spots, and it rebooted and came back up just at the end of a drum solo. But we got lucky. It was a hog three. It just those don't exist <laughs> anymore, and ETC didn't own that company at the time. Disclaimer, <laughs> disclaimer, right, David? Yeah, yeah. Roya. Uh, I mean, I don't know if this is is embarrassing or horrifying, but uh, Eric, your story just reminded me of a. Um, we were on a uh, tour in Norway and our sea container got lost <laughs> at sea um, and um, didn't show up. And so uh, we were all scrambling to uh, find things to put this performance on and our, our costume um, people were at H&M buying clothes and uh, our props people were out gathering sticks and spray painting them and and we were trying to make up some sort of light plot with the fixtures that they had in the in the theater and um, the sea container ended up showing up about two hours before curtain so we got we got a lot of it out <laughs> <laughs> Wow oh, that's great uh, I, do have, I do have one thing I think that's a couple questions back uh, and it's sure. weird and we're in a we're in a time now when it's hard. It's it's difficult to say this correctly. Uh, our industry generally goes out after after a show or after a rough, rough rehearsal to a bar or a restaurant to decompress. It is important to do that, whether you drink or don't drink or or something like that. Go and have a water. Go and have a soda. Those are the times when you find out. You just get to know your team, and and you know there's really nothing wrong with okay. It's been a long day. I'll see you all tomorrow, and and go home. But you're really going to build relationships by going to going to the bar. Uh, it's just that's the way it works. Um, I've personally been called out for suggesting that uh, in open forums um, like Facebook pages that that's not necessarily appropriate these days. But I, that's the way I see it. Part of the culture in England. Yep. Everybody mm -hmm. goes to the pub after rehearsal. Yep. And that's where the director, you know, you're going to just get to know the director or the assistant director or the assistant choreographer who's got two other shows that year that uh, uh, even though your lighting designer, your chief head lighting designer is busy, you may have time. And that assistant director is going to be like, hey, what are you doing? So mm -hmm. it's a lot of a lot of networking gets done. Don't don't sleep on it. That, that's great, Eric. And I think, um, you know, I'm sorry, Roya, did you have something else to say there? No, I'm good. Okay, great. Um, you know, as we're, we're finishing up here, I think that's a great note to finish on. And, and, you know, one of the things with this, this program that's so wonderful has always been being able to have these kind of conversations. And, you know, typically we would be at LDI and we would meet in person and we would, we would have a cocktail or a, or a water or whatever in our hand and we'd be having these, these conversations. And I think it's wonderful that we're able to use this technology now and, and be able to see one another and ask questions and, and at least do it in this format uh, as we are in this current current environment because networking and, and talking and hearing what other people have to say, what professionals have to say, what folks you may work with that you haven't worked with yet. I mean, 
that that's all a very important thing. So, uh, David, I want to thank you again and ETC for uh, making making this go again and and pulling it together in this year. And uh, thanks to our mentors who have all joined us tonight. We really appreciate you and and thank you for the students for uh, for coming on and asking some great questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Roy, for being a great moderator. <laughs> thank you, Josh. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. We appreciate you guys. Uh...